Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the St. Thomas Aquinas Vienna Center. I just want to welcome everybody from the surf community, the beach community, the ocean community, the Fort Lauderdale community. So welcome. And now uh, I want to introduce to you guys Garrett McNamara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. So the, uh, the video was amazing. Um, I guess I just want to start off with, is that biggest wave you've ever surfed your favorite, or do you find joys in other places of surfing? Well, I've been pounded so many times. <laughs> I don't really remember my last wave, so <laughs> they're all like new first time experiences and, and I enjoy surfing waves of all sizes in, in all different countries and here in Florida we've had some fun waves <laughs> and my five year old, my, we really did, my five year old daughter, I took her out and she caught her first waves here and now she just loves surfing because of your perfect warm water. Well you've been surfing for a long time, when did you finally fall in love with it and, and make that leap? Um, well, when I was about 11, my mother forced my brother and I to move to Hawaii. She forced us. <laughs> <laughs> she literally did. We went kicking and screaming. The only thing that enticed us was, she said there was surfing. It's real similar to skateboarding, but in the water. So I thought, oh, okay, if I fall, I won't hit the cement. That sounds nice. Yeah. Well, cushion. And um, at 11, when we moved there is when I first started. And we really, we didn't have much. You know, my, we were, my mom was on welfare, single mother, and she provided us what we ne needed, but we didn't have everything we wanted. But she got us a surfboard, and I would just go out and surf, and I just, it was a place to get away. You know, the, all you need is this board in the water, and it's just so fun, and I fell in love from the first day I got in the water. Well, I know, you know, with any sport, you kind of, you can't go from flag football to the NFL. Um, but I mean, here, did you jump right from, you know, surfing, I guess, normal sized waves right into the monsters? Or was there a progression? How did that, how did that kind of build? When I first got there, I started surfing small waves and just surfed because I loved it. And that just pure and simple. And... As I got better, I started going bigger, and then I went out to sunset, and it was about, I don't know, 10, 12 foot faces, and I got pounded really bad. And I was about, I don't know, 14 years old, and I, sw I swore to never surf a wave over six feet. I was like, I'm <laughs> never going out over six feet. And I had these two friends that I hung out with, and they were top pros, but they didn't surf over 10 foot faces. I'm like, I'm gonna be just like those guys. And, uh, Finally, when I was about 16, a friend of mine, an older guy that I was hanging out with, he gave me the right board and literally grabbed me by my neck and forced me to go out to sunset. And uh, I paddled out there, so scared, I didn't, just, just didn't even want to go out. And he forced me to get out there, got out there, and finally I paddled into a wave. The board was perfect. I caught the wave perfectly and rode it all the way. And then I just caught so many waves because I had the right board. And I don't know, everything just came together. And from that day forward, I loved big waves. It's really about having the right equipment and having somebody to um, mentor you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, uh, I think we have another uh, little GoPro clip here we can uh, take a look at. What's this going to be? <laughs> <laughs>
So, I mean, that thing was huge. What's the, <laughs> what do you do? What's the preparation for something like that? What's it like getting worked? That was probably the biggest wave I've ever been pounded by. And every wipeout is so different. Uh, that, that was um, after six hours of towing and had the best waves I've ever had in Nazare. And then I decided, okay, I want to paddle into one. And uh, my buddy looks at me like, haven't you had enough? And I'm like, no, just get my big board and watch over me. So I jump off a ski paddle for the first wave. I turn around and look, and this thing was so big. And I'm actually trying to take my leash off and paddle. Take, and I couldn't get the leash off. And as I swam through that wave, I thought I might be able to get through, but I have this massive flotation wetsuit that's all padded, and it has padding in certain areas so that if all my vulnerable points, for one, it protects me from the board or from the reef or from the ski, but two, I come up. But when you try and swim through a wave, you're a cork. So I went and just over. The, the wave just it was like being in an elevator and you cut and 100 miles an hour. Luckily, it's all sand. So the sandbar, I'm not too worried about hitting the reef or hitting the bottom, but when you're, after six hours, you're kind of tired, and then when you're going 100 miles an hour, and then you're underwater, just getting tossed around like a grain of sand, and you're just, you feel like you're a part of something so much bigger, you know, the world just feels like such a small place when you're under a huge wave like that, and um, as you're getting pounded, you're, usually praying, saying prayers, please God, please God, and going around in different directions like a washing machine on spin cycle. And when I came up from that one, my friend came in to get me, he couldn't get me the first one, so I got a brass, go back under. Another one came up, got a brass, go back under. And then finally he comes in, and when he came in, he said I had the biggest smile on my face, and I was just like, yeah, I was so happy. I just felt so alive. But that wave is a sandbar, so generally safe. Then you got places like Tahiti, where you're going over the fall, same scenario, but it's the sharpest reef in the world. And it's, it's literally, you're surfing below reef level. The wave moves forward, the whole ocean moves forward. The bottom drops out, and the water is actually coming off the reef like a waterfall and sucking the wave below reef level, the reef is here, and you're riding the wave there. So when you fall, and you're getting sucked over, and you're going 100 miles an hour towards the reef, and that's when you're really praying, and that's when it, it's, I mean, I've gotten my whole leg ripped off. Uh, I got scars everywhere from Tahiti, and then you got places like Jaws, where it's really deep, and, and I'll be cartwheeling down these giant waves, and and it's kind of just like, okay, here we go again. Just you know, relax and have fun. As long as you relax, you can survive. It's like a rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the waves coming this way, are you diving like straight down? You angling, coming up to try to get past the falls? What's the if, trajection? Is that the word? The if it's just a white water coming at me, I just go like that, like mm -hmm. just one little stroke and just let it take you. And with the float suits, it usually pushes you out the back pretty quick. If it doesn't, it grabs a hold of you, it can take you for a football field underwater. All the way in. But you're, you're relaxed the whole time. So you're just, and you're out of the impact zone by the time you come up. So either way, it's really beneficial with the flotation on. Um, when you're facing a big wall, and I mean, I had one at Jaws this year. I, I was on my second session. I was really tired. And I'm paddling back out. I'm going, okay, I should probably go in. I'm getting tired. I don't think I can handle a big wipeout right now. And all of a sudden, I got sucked over towards the left. And then all of a sudden, here comes this giant set. And I'm just, oh, no. And I'm paddling as hard as I can. And I get over the first one. And the second one is, and I jump off my board, swim through, and somehow made it through the back with all the flotation on. And I pull my board. Look at these super thick leashes now. And the board comes right through. I'm like, oh, right. I grab my board and start paddling again. There's Shane Doran coming down this 50, 60-foot wave. And I'm here and the lip lands there. 
And, and we got these flotation devices now that we pull them in our, we implode. Uh, real similar to the ones on the airplanes, but we use them for surfing now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I see this thing break and I pull it before I go underwater. So I was like, oh no, I'm like this huge <laughs> Michelin dough ball and here comes this giant white water and I'm, I can't go underwater and just destroys me. And then underwater, Somehow, I, I, uh, there's a deflate, and I deflated it. So all of a sudden, I'm at the bottom, and I can't go up. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I pull it again. So lucky there's four canisters. Oh, I was going to ask. So I pull it again, <laughs> and I come up. Get, I, I'm coming up to the surface, and I, you, when you're paddling to get up from so deep and trying to get up, and as soon as your lips come out of the water, you're like, <gasps> and I look, and there was this white. It looked like the sky, but it was another wave, and I barely got a breath, and another one on my head. And then um, I pulled again, so I had two canisters full, and I'm coming up quick. And then there's another one, another one, and Jesse comes to rescue me. He can't get me. Another one, another one. He comes to get me, can't get me. After about 20 waves, my board is literally bouncing off the rocks. I'm bouncing off the rocks, and I deflate so I can kind of swim to the channel, and I finally make it out on my own, and then the jet ski guy comes and rescues me again. <laughs> I mean, you know you're being watched out there. Is it comforting and you still feel alone no matter what? You Down have deep. to be able to rely on yourself. You have mm -hmm. to be able to rely on your wetsuit being ripped off and nothing. If you can't rely on yourself alone without any flotation, without a jet ski, then you shouldn't be out there. Out. A lot of these waves that we're surfing nowadays are almost not humanly possible to survive without the safety gear. Mm -hmm. If you had like that same situation that I had, if I didn't have my flotation, I, I probably would have passed out. Wow. Well, I know there's a lot of teamwork out there, um, but what kind of preparation goes into that? I mean, do you stay with the same ski, you know, the same tow guy? What do you do physically to kind of prepare for a beating like that or the, the workout that you got to endure? You're, you're really only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And it's about surrounding yourself <laughs> with people that are really good at what they do, but also really good energy, really positive. And um, in Portugal, the team we have there is so amazing. We have, like, I have my driver, mm -hmm. and I prefer to use Kaylee Mamala, my Hawaiian partner, but a lot of times he's not around, and I work with Andrew Cotton, who's really good from the UK. And then we have a safety driver, who's usually Hugo from Portugal. And then sometimes you fly in Kamaki, who is a fireman from mm -hmm. Hawaii. Um, then we have, first and foremost, Nicole, my wife, on the cliff with the walkie-talkie. And then we have three to five other guys along the, the shoreline and the lighthouse and the different strategical points on the cliff with walkie-talkies. And then the safety ski has a walkie-talkie. The initial driving ski has a walkie-talkie. And then we have the lifeguard with a quad, and we have another quad with just one of our safety guys. Then we have the fire department, and we have an ambulance. And so the it's team a scene is out huge. there. You're making a scene. So it, it's safety first, and you have to be, you know, um, manage everything ahead of time, plan ahead for everything that can go wrong, and then there's always the unknown that you just have to be able to deal with it and stay calm. And that was Nicole's voice we heard on the. Yeah, with her. She's, she's my lifeline out there. She actually tells me which ways to go for. Yeah? Literally, she's like, no, number two. If I don't listen to her, that's when I get in trouble. <laughs> so she really is. Not from her, from Mother Nature smacks me. You better listen to your wife. <laughs> so the women are always in control, pretty much, what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so aside from preparation, what's your, what's your diet like? Is there anything special? Um, yeah, I really focus on eating, having a, a plant-based diet. There's a lot of vegetables, a lot of raw vegetables, mm -hmm. a lot of salads, um, a lot of, you know, organic, non-GMO. And it's really about knowing where your food comes from. And, and if you have the ability to grow your own food, even better, be self-sufficient. We travel so much. And in, in Portugal, we have this one restaurant that we eat at every day, lunch and dinner and they have their own organic garden. Wow. 
Wow. And this, this woman is our, our Portuguese mother. She, they don't have Thanksgiving, but she makes us an amazing Thanksgiving dinner. That's the one time of year that we eat turkey. And, um, and I do eat a steak here and there. And, and uh, you know, food is so good. We're going to Italy. I'm probably going to eat everything. <laughs> but uh, we really work on a plant-based diet. Whenever you eat anything that might not be ideally what you think the perfect food is, make sure you mix it with vegetables. And right before a big serve, is there like a, I don't want to say last meal, but like a meal you might eat to <laughs> more protein in there, something to energize you? Is it you try to stick to the same thing, that way you're comfortable and, and relaxed? I have an Irish gut, so I can almost eat anything right before I go in the water. Tough. I can just go straight out 10 minutes after I eat, five minutes. I can eat and go straight in the water. So I can literally eat anything I want before I go surfing, but... I really prefer to eat light, mm -hmm. run like a well-oiled machine light, and it's more about what you eat the night before or even two nights before. But during the actual surf session, I'll bring you know, a little, uh, a, a lot of water. Water is essential. It keeps you going no matter what's going on. And then you know, you'll have an energy bar, I mean, uh, some kind of energy drink or energy bar, but right now we work with a body glove surge and it's um, all natural, GMO-free energy. And I really work on staying away from those kinds of things, but those things just give me so much energy. I love them <laughs> so much. <Yeah. laughs> so before you go out, I mean, a lot of professional athletes have like a, a way to get their mind in the game and that kind of thing. Do you have a ritual or a, like a routine you do every time you go out or is it kind of just check the conditions and, and get prepared, you're bored? And... Every day's different. Um, no matter what size it is, if I'm paddling, as soon as I enter the water, I'm just paddling out there just thanking God for such an amazing life and such an amazing playground and, and the water and the waves and friends. And, and I just find myself just thanking God on my way out. Uh, when it's really big, I always have a plan in place and I'll make my plan the night before. My wife and I will discuss what's coming and what I would like to do with that on the next day. Mm -hmm. And then we wait to see what actually transpires, what actually comes in. And then if it's what we were hoping for, then we stick to that plan. And as I enter the water, I'll grab my, my boys, all my team, and uh, we say a nice prayer before we go out. And then we go do what we plan to do. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, A after the surf session, it's clean the equipment and get some food and either go straight to bed or if it's still time to go back out, get food and get straight back in the water. The second surf session? Yeah, or third one even. Yeah, sweet. At Jaws, I'll surf two sessions. We, we usually take a boat out there or a jet ski. And actually, the last few times, Nicole was with me on the boat. And I'll have all these extra boards and all this extra equipment. And I'll bring a wave jet. Because after two sessions, I'm beat, and everybody's beat, and everybody's going in. And then I bust out my wave jet, and it's just amazing. I have actually my funnest session on the wave jet. And what's a wave jet for anybody that might not? It's uh, basically just like that surfboard there, but it has a little uh, engine in the bottom. It's kind of shaped like an egg. And it's very similar to what a jet ski does, but in the bottom of the surfboard. And it only goes seven knots, but... It's, a, it's about paddle speed, but you don't have to paddle. So you can get where you want to go and just kind of guide it and then save all your energy. And then when you finally go for the wave, you paddle and catch it. And you can focus all your energy on riding that wave. And then if you end up wiping out, you're, you've conserved all your energy. So three, three, you know, about six hours in, you're getting kind of tired. So a third session, if you can conserve as much energy as possible, you can keep going. And the board rides... Comfortably I, I or love it. I love it. For big waves, it's amazing. For learning, it's the best board there is for learning. I mean, you can learn on a lake. You just, it runs from a little watch. You press a button, it goes, and you're standing on it in the lake, laying turns. And, it's, no it's, and then for learning, I mean, Carlos and Nicole's fathers had them at his camp all summer, and the kids, there's so many flat days here. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we I know. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you get on that wave jet, and they're surfing, no matter how big it is. Awesome. Flat and all. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Well, uh, I think we got another uh, little clip to check out uh, before we keep going, so we'll take a look. So, we're so fortunate. We get to do what we love. We get to wake up every morning to think about where we're going to go surf. It's just, I mean, it's a dream. So you do wipe out. <laughs> I've been known to take a few wipeouts. I guess you have to out there. Um, what's the key, if there is one, to conquering waves like that, conquering the fear and kind of overcoming that when you're in the water? Well, first I want to explain one of those waves. One of those waves I was on the wave jet, that one that I did the somersaults. And so you still have to paddle or that happens. I didn't paddle hard enough on that one. but. Um, Fear, fear is a choice. Fear is something we manufacture in our mind. It's when we think about the past or think about the future. And if you're in the moment and enjoying the moment and making the best of the moment, there is no fear. It's, it's, it's when we choose to think about what has happened in our past. And you, you, you might relate, okay, you're paddling into the wave and, and you're about to fall and, and you you got hurt or you almost drown and all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, that might, oh, this might have, or if you just choose to enjoy it like that, all, all those wipeouts, I thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> I had an amazing time underwater. It's a ride after the ride, the underwater ride, and I really enjoyed every one of those wipeouts and, um, because I chose to. And I mean, we have a lot of surfers out here tonight, but other athletes as well. Does that compare to any other sport? Could you relate it to, you know, the pressures of walking onto a football field or the track or, you know, a soccer pitch or anything like that? Conquering the fear? Yeah, it, it, it applies to everything in life. Everything you do. Um, you, if you stay in the moment, then y you will enjoy it. Like if you're going out for a football game and you're all nervous, there's no reason to be like coming here tonight to talk. I could have been nervous coming up here, but I know it's going to be what it is, and I'm going to have fun, and, and there's no reason to be nervous. So I was, wasn't nervous, and I'm not nervous, and I don't know how... Were you nervous? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, and like with anything, going out on the football field, getting ready to take a test. I mean, there's ways to reset yourself and and um, calm yourself down, and, and there's all different things that I do, especially when I'm out in the big waves, to stay focused and stay in the moment, because we can always drift and wander and think about this and think about that, and, and, and you have to bring yourself back now. I've heard so many people say, like, oh, you should go to a different place or you know, go to your happy place or something, but so you're focused on the moment, what's going on around you being aware, you're not trying to disappear in any other la-la land, you're there. When I'm doing hold my breath training and I'm really focusing on staying down there for four minutes, I do go to my happy place. I think about my wife smiling and, and you know, my, my baby now. That will be my next little happy place. And, um, and it really helps you slow your heart rate down and helps you relax and, and see how long you can stay underwater. But when I'm getting pounded, I really am just going with it and enjoying it. And, and, and the only time that I really, uh, really uh, 
tend to face a little fear and tend to start praying is like in Tahiti when I'm going full speed for the reef. And all the other places I've been held down for a long period of time have been comfortable. I've never had a near-death experience. So I really do enjoy it. But in Tahiti, the reef, Father says, yes. waiting for you. And I've gotten... So I choose to think about what happened in the past, and all of a sudden I'm going, hey God, don't let me get that rock again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you've been injured before. You said you've been dragged across the reef and things like that. What do you do to kind of stay active and, and keep moving if you're out of surfing for a week or a month or whatever it is? What do you do to overcome the injury and come back from it? Well, being here for the last two months was a perfect example. <laughs> you didn't come here to surf then? You didn't come to Lauderdale to surf? I've actually been b uh, battling a shoulder injury and for the last two years I, w I haven't been 100% and we came here to have the baby because Nicole's mom's here and she's like an angel of the, you know, bro. and of course we got her dad to give us a hard time <laughs> <laughs> no, Carlos is amazing too. <laughs> but um, I, I find myself going, oh no, what am I doing here? This is surfer's hell. Because oh. <laughs> 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 it's the water's so clean and beautiful and warm, and and you get out there and it feels so good. And there's like, where's the waves? And then when they come, they're nice and perfect for my my daughter. But what I <laughs> what I did was focus on training and healing myself and I wake up every day from four to six to go to the gym and then I had a trainer and then I, I would go to Bikram's yoga with Pachi and uh, actually got some work done on my teeth here there's an amazing dentist here that took really good care of me she's actually here Ariani <laughs> and um, so I took care of things that would have been on the back burner. Mm -hmm. if I, when I'm surfing, I'm surfing. And there's no time for anything. I surf all day and I'm tired and I go to sleep. And uh, the sponsors want pictures or want questions answered or want, these people want interviews or, you know, there's so many different things that are involved with a career of big wave surfing that you wouldn't realize. And so many things get left undone. So if I'm injured or if I'm somewhere where there's no waves, it's when I take care of all the loose ends and take care of all these things that I don't have time to take care of or I'm just too tired to take care of when I'm surfing all day, all day long. Gotcha. Well, then how do you turn, you know, you're talking about surfing as a career, how do you turn your passion, which is big wave surfing, into a, a career that you can sustain financially and you know, create a lifestyle through it? Well, with... Uh, Big wave surfing, you, for me, I, I, I love big wave surfing, my passion. So I was at the end of my career, I was about 35 and I was about to retire. I had reti semi-retired, I wasn't barely getting paid anything from sponsors and I opened a surf shop. And I was pretty much just opening that store so that was my next chapter of my life. So I had, you know, security. Mm -hmm. And I was going to work every day, driving by perfect waves, and I was not happy at all. And it was, in Hawaii, the waves are good all the time. And, uh, and I've, it's, I mean, just, per Lania K is my favorite spot, and it just, and it's on the way to work, and I had to look at it every day. It was a nightmare. So after two or three years of this, I went, I can't do this anymore. And I, I said, okay, how do I keep surfing? I, I, I said, okay, I got to make a plan. I got to make a, a map, a business, for lack of a better word, a business plan. But it, it was basically keep surfing was the goal. <laughs> <laughs> and underneath it was how. And so I wrote win the eddy and win the Jaws tow-in contest. And then I wrote everything that I had to do physically, mentally, and spiritually to win those events. And I focused 110% on those things that I felt I needed to do to accomplish those goals. And it worked. And I won the Jaws contest. And there was uh, a Jaws 70-foot waves and $70,000 purse. And I was able to close the store and keep surfing. Yeah. Uh, 
But it, it, it was all because of the map. You know, you, you have a map, you have a guideline, you, you, you figure out what you're passionate about, figure out what you love to do, and then you don't have to be the guy surfing. You can be associated to surfing by being the guy who takes the pictures or being the guy who has a clothing company that's around. So, I mean, there's all these different things to do. But every day you wake up with purpose and direction. You know what you're doing. And anything that you do that isn't a part of this, you're getting further away from, your, from doing what you love to do. So I have a plan. Um, I was going to ask how to get paid to surf. Um, if you guys want to take notes and stuff. but How to get paid to surf? You could totally get paid to surf. You figure out your niche in the surfing world. Everybody has one. Everybody has something special, and, and all you need is a niche. Well, I don't know um, what it is. Maybe playing guitar and then surfing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound so bad. Um, well, we got a really special board behind us. Um, was made for you, so we got a, a quick video clip to kind of talk about that. So okay. we'll check that out. Big waves are my passion. It's what I love. It's what I live for. Just wind blowing in your face. And it's just magical. I fell in love the day I hit the water when I was 11 years old in Hawaii. Every second of my life, all I thought about was the next surf session, how to get a good board, where I was gonna go surf. When you're coming down a giant wave here, you're going faster than you've ever gone, and then this monster's chasing you. And then there's these giant chops, and you're hitting them so hard, da, da. And your brain's getting rattled, your bones are getting rattled, your whole body's getting rattled. And for that type of a wave, we have to design a special board. And this board needs to be the fastest board you've ever surfed. A sleek, sexy, fast board. So I can only imagine what it's gonna look like. It's the challenge of, of speed and of dynamics. The surfboard is a very pure body. It's half flying, it's floating, which makes this board and to digitize a board like that and to work with board design a very special thing. Now we had a lot of questions. What happens to the board? What happens to you, Garrett, when you get hit by the wave? What is the main dynamic moment? What's the maximum speed? So we exchanged aerodynamical, water, aquadynamical aspects. The thing that we could perfect on this is right between here and here, we'll make it as stiff as possible, like with carbon fiber, mm -hmm. make it really stiff. Mm -hmm. And then from here forward, we make it really flexy mm -hmm. with um, Kevlar or I don't know what other materials. Okay. We gotta have flex in the nose, so when you hit, it's a smoother hit. It doesn't shock through your whole body. <laughs> it, it goes doo -doo -doo -doo. It's like, ka -ka -ka -ka. and um, we also want to see how fast we're going. Everybody, all, I mean, news yeah. reporters, people yeah. everywhere. Yeah. How fast are you going? I don't, I don't know. I think 30 to 70. Yeah, yeah, that, I think um, especially extreme wave surfers, they have a very high speed when they surf. We asked uh, Garrett just now, he doesn't know exactly, but I guess it's somewhere around 50, 60 kilometers an hour. And at that speed, the air resistance is a matter of fact. So we can blow, for example, that speed, and uh, he, he can feel the wind resistance very precise and can uh, optimize his uh, stand.
So that's it. That's the board, yeah. Anything to say about it before we? Um, you know, it's all about, as I was saying in the beginning, who you surround yourself with and, and aligning yourself with good people and good companies. And I would never imagine working with Mercedes. And, and they actually, after we focused all of our energy on Nazare and bringing attention to Nazare and to Portugal and, and basically somewhat selfless, helping that little town. And all of a sudden, here comes Mercedes, comes to me and, and says, we got an idea, we have a campaign. And, and they show me this campaign. I'm just like, I was so in awe and blown away and honored and happy. And, and I couldn't believe it. And, and, uh, and it just was so surprising to have a company like that want to get involved with surfing. And they came to us and they said, we don't want to just sponsor you and pay you a check. We want to get in the water with you. We want to make a board for you. And I'm just, I was, so it's really about that map again and making your plan and, and, and surrounding yourself with good people and then good things come. And that's amazing. I'm just, I'm still, I'm lost for words when it comes to that whole relationship. It's awesome. Um, so you've got a lot of recognition from Big Wave Surfing and then the sponsors and Mercedes. What's your, how do you give back to the community and the environment? What's the best way for you to kind of give back from what you've, what you've gained? Well, in Portugal with Nazare, it's just been amazing. Just everybody is just so happy what has transpired there. We got there and there was literally not one person at the lighthouse the whole winter. The next one or a few more people show up and now you can't drive your car down there. There's thousands of people oh. there on the big days. So for Portugal, we really brought a lot to Nazare in the wintertime when there's nothing going on. In the summer it's crowded, but the winter is nothing. But there we do a beach cleanup with Surf Rider, which is annual and um, Surf Rider Portugal. And it's a great way to just show the children what happens when you throw something on the ground three miles away, a mile away, three miles away, five miles away, it ends up in a storm drain, comes out on, in the water and it ends up on the beach. And we pick up all these things on the beach and they're just like, they can't believe that something that there's no way it should be on the beach and, and it's on the beach. And so we educate them and you activate one kid at a time and, mm -hmm. and, uh, then there's uh, surfers healing for taking autistic children surfing. We go all over the East Coast and a little bit on the West Coast. This year we didn't have time with the baby and all, but um, it's really amazing to provide a service for these families. These these you know once your child is diagnosed with autism, a lot of your hopes and dreams just out the door mm -hmm. and. They never really dream of their child ever surfing. And so we have a day for the families to bring their children and we take them surfing and the parents are on the beach and they're crying we're coming in and we're crying, everybody's crying. It's, it's tears of joy and tears of sadness and, and it really just recharges my battery. I, mean, I feel selfish because it makes me feel so good and just sharing our passion, what we love with somebody who would never imagine surfing. And that's another way I give back. And, you know, there's um, so many different things you can do, but I just love doing surface healing. I love bringing awareness to the beaches and we're working with Surf Rider. Wow. Yeah, actually here at this school, we're, we're looking to activate a, a junior club, a Surf Rider junior club for this school. And that's one of the goals of this. Sounds great. Um, Joe said he'll run it. Where's Joe? He'll be, he'll, he'll, he'll right, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we saw so many waves that you've surfed. Is there one that stands out in your mind the most? One that just makes it all worth it? In uh, 2003, my goal up to that 
date was to get barreled on a 20-foot wave. I never really got a, a really good barrel on a 20-foot wave. And it was a year after we won the contest, we went back to Jaws. And Dane Kiloa was a Hawaiian legend, one of the best surfers of all time. And um, he's driving the ski, and he drives by me, and I'm sitting there in the water on my tow board, and, and he, he drives by, and he, he, he's, oh, I'm O'Day, and he's, oh, hey, what's up here? And he's, he's I'm, I'm, are you driving anybody? And he's like, what, nobody driving you? I'm like, no, and he just throws me the rope. And I'm sitting there on my tow board, and I'm in the channel, and I grab the rope, and I look at him, oh, can you drive? Because I don't know if you can drive or not. <laughs> this is some big Hawaiian. He's like, you can, what are you, little Howley? What are you talking about? So I'm like, oh, you can drive, you can drive. So he picks me up. We start going out. And there's literally 50 skis out there. And everybody's hungry. And everybody wants to wave. And we drive around the channel. And we're coming around. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're going to stop. And we're going to wait. And we're going to you know, be respectful and wait our turn. But Dane's driving. He does a big U-turn. Here comes a set. We go straight in for the first wave of the set and he's driving right in the perfect spot and he lets me go right at the right time I start coming down and I look up and the wave is right here and, and I, I'm thinking to myself okay it's coming together here's that barrel that I've been focusing on that I want that I've been working towards and instead of turning I check it a little bit and then turn at the last second and right as I turn the lip comes over and hits me in the face and it actually brushed me three times as I'm entering the wave. So we'll show all the way right here and then I'll finish the story, okay? So right as I turned under that lip, and it hit me, it blinded me, and I got in there, and all I'm thinking is, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, but I can't see, and, it, <laughs> and I'm just feeling my way through it, and right as I start to straighten out, it starts to pull me backwards, and I feel this, this like this backdraft pulling me, and I'm falling backwards, and I'm like, oh, I got to make it, I got to make it, and my feet are my straps, so I'm still on the board. And all of a sudden, this hurricane force wind comes from behind, picks me up, I'm still blind, and literally picks me up and throws me out in front of the wave. So when I land, I'm just, I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, thank you, God. <laughs> it wasn't a claim. I was talking to the man. <laughs> you watch it one more time? <laughs> okay. You want to watch it again? So we'll, uh, we'll eventually get to some Q&As, but before we do, do you have any advice for young surfers, young athletes, people aspiring to kind of do what you do, turn a passion into a career? I would say no matter what you do in life, everybody is born with a unique talent. Everybody can do something better than everybody else. It, they, they all will do it a little different. So in that aspect, it's better than anybody else. So if you, you focus on, first and foremost, what you're passionate about. Figure out your passion. Then figure out how to make it your life. Make your map. What you feel you need to do to do what you love to do for the rest of your life. And it is possible. I mean, when I wrote that list, I... Everybody always told me you can do what you love, you can do what you love, and, and I thought it was such a cliche, and, and I went ahead and went for it at 35 years old. It was the first time I wrote my map. I'm living proof that you make your map, you follow it, everything is possible, and anything is possible. It's never too early, and it's never too late. 